let's get started. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone uh, to the uh, new session of the uh, One World Combinatorics on Worlds uh, on Words seminar. Uh, thank you all for uh, for coming. Um, yeah, we'll just uh, we'll we'll start uh, right away. Our first uh, our first speaker uh, of this uh, uh, new season is uh, Bastian Espinoza from uh, the University de, de Chile and the University de Picardie uh, Jules Verne. Uh, he's going to speak to us about the structure of low complexity subshed. Uh, thanks for the interaction yeah. and for, for inviting me to present to this seminar. Uh, I will talk about uh, two recent structure theorems that I developed during my PhD thesis in these universities about a class of symbolic systems that we call of low complexity. Uh, so in general, I, I will use the language of simple dynamics because that's my main uh, area of specialization. And that's why I will start with some review of these uh, general ideas uh, of simple dynamics and how they led to uh, the statement of a conjecture that in the area is known as the SRD conjecture. And that is the main motivation of this work, a uh, way to solve that conjecture. Um, I will also introduce uh, direct, directed sequences and um, how this static terminology um, is very useful uh, for describing structures in symbolic dynamics, especially in the low complexity setting. And then I will present the, the two structure theorems and some discussion of future uh, work, open problems, etc. So uh, we understand words from a dynamical point of view. We, we understand that words uh, moves in, uh, according to certain dynamics that I will define later. Uh, and in general, in dynamical systems, we're interested in long-term qualitative properties of these systems. In general, these systems are too complicated to be understood um, uh, in a precise way, in a quantitative way. So we rely on long-term qualitative, qualitative properties. Um, I will give an example to, to, to give a feeling of what we mean with these long-term properties. So we use the standard terminology of commentary and words. Alphabets are denoted by capital calligraphic letters. We use non-empty, uh, sorry, sets of non-empty words, A plus, B plus, et cetera. And the central object here in symbolic dynamics is the full chain. So we consider the set of all B infinite uh, sequences of symbols that we see as B infinite words. And we give uh, to these sets a topology. Uh, it is equipped with the product topology of the discrete topologies of the finite sets, the alphabets. Um, it, is inter it is important to have a topology because we want to take limits. We're interested in long-term properties, so limits are something important. Uh, this is a compact metrizable space. Um, um, okay, uh, as I was saying, uh, we, and, uh, we, we see the points in the full chip as B infinite words, so we write them in this particular way. Uh, we use the dot to indicate the zero coordinate. Um, and a more succinct way of describing this uh, topology is by stating which sequences converge. This is a metrizable space, so this is enough to, to, to characterize the topology. And the thing here is that a sequence of points xk converges if and only if they uh, converge pointwise. Uh, so in this case, it means that um, for each coordinate, the sequence restricted to that coordinate is eventually constant. Uh, the dynamics uh, here in symbolic dynamics comes from the shift map. Uh, it is defined in uh, like this. It simply shifts the points one position to the left. Um, the shift map is a homeomorphism of the uh, of the full shift, and then we can define a symbolic system or a subshift for short, uh, which is simply a closed subset of the of, of the full shift that is invariant by the by the shift. So the first thing is that we want it to be closed because we want to take limits. And we want it to be invariant by the shift because we want that one point is moved by the dynamics to another point in the same space. Um, in general, if we start with a set of finite, uh, sorry, a set of bi-infinite uh, words, then we can obtain a subject by simply taking the closure of the order. So, uh, subject is almost the same as a set of infinite words. Uh, okay, uh, the thing here is that uh, the world of symbolic dynamics is huge in the sense that we can observe a lot of things, a lot of dynamical behavior inside the class. Uh, in general, there are many connections with other areas, with other type of problems, even uh, things that are more applied from applied mathematics. Uh, so uh, this implies that uh, we have a good framework, but at the same, at the same time, we have uh, something uh, uh, that is too, too big to be understood uh, in general, uh, there are no uh, general theorems that hold for any symbolic uh, dynamical system. That's why we need something to try to uh, to 
to distinguish between systems and to distinguish between the different type of dynamical behavior that we can observe. And the first tool, the most basic tool that we have uh, is the complexity fund. It is defined like this. It simply counts the number of words of a given length that occur in at least one point of the subject, finite subwords. And we're interested mostly in the growth rate of the complexity function. It is important to say that although this complexity function is defined in purely combinatorial terms, uh, it uh, has a motivation that comes from uh, the abstract theory and the general theory of measurable dynamics from topological dynamics. Uh, and that's in this particular setting of simple dynamics, it takes this combinatorial form. Um, it has a dynamical interpretation. The growth rate of, of the complexity function measures how random are the orbit of S. If the growth is very big, for example, exponential, then uh, the orbits are very random. We have a lot, a lot of freedom in building the orbits. And so uh, uh, the system uh, could be very complex. That's the idea. Um, OK, uh, the most classic case of the complexity function is uh, the case in which it grows exponentially. Uh, this is the case of subject of finite types, something that related to even applications. Uh, for uh, it, it was something relevant during the development of storage uh, hardware uh, for uh, storage. Uh, but somewhat more recently, the low complexity case, more precisely the zero entropy case, the, uh, the case in which the complexity function grows sub-exponentially, uh, became something more relevant uh, because there are many examples that started to appear within this uh, framework. And that low complexity case is what we want to study. So uh, before continuing, I want to give an example of how uh, there are interaction between simple dynamics and these dynamical defined terms and long-term properties with other things from other areas that are more, uh, let's say, concrete. So uh, the example starts here with an irrational number, sorry, irrational number, and we consider its decimal expansion, u. We can see u as an infinite word, one-sided infinite word, uh, very similar to the other framework. This is the, first, uh, the only time that we are going to use one-sided infinite words. And we can form a symbolic uh, system by simply taking the closure in the full chip uh, of the orbit of the point u. Point u. And then we, can connect, uh, we have connections with, between properties of the irrational number x and dy dynamical properties. For, for example, the frequency f0 with which the digit zero occurs in the decimal expansion effect is equal to this thing that is a big technical to read. But the important thing is that this is uh, called an ergodic sum. And we have a lot of tools that come from dynamical system and measurable dynamics uh, that, um, um, that are very useful and are very effective with dealing with these kind of things. Uh, there are deep works related to uh, ergodic sums. We can uh, understand very complicated type of, type of sums and so on. So we have this connection between dynamical, uh, uh, dynamical uh, tools and concrete things. And another thing that I want to mention, and that is going to be relevant uh, at some point in, in the talk, is this uh, result that says that if we have this restriction on the complexity, we, we call uh, that in this case, if this complexity assumption holds, that the subchip x is of non-superlinear growth complexity, uh, then we have the number x is transcendental. So we have a connection between a dynamical property and uh, the property of being transcendental, which at first may be completely unrelated. This is a paper of um, Chelsea and Bigot that appeared in Annals of Mathematics in 2007. So uh, we have a uh, simple dynamics as something that connects uh, dynamical properties to other areas, and it's very interesting. So uh, we want to uh, develop tools to understand uh, simple systems. So we're going to focus on the low complexity case. Um, and more precisely, we're going to consider these two complexity cases. The first one on the right is the non-superlinear growth complexity, the one that appeared in the, in the theorem of the last slide. And the other one is the linear growth complexity. It's very similar looking. The only difference is the lim sub and the lim inf. And we're going to consider this because over the years, it appeared, it was clear that many interesting examples belong to these classes. For example, we have that substitution dynamical systems are of linear growth complexity in the minimal case. Um, and substitutional dynamics dynamical system were the initial models of the type of dynamical behavior that can be observed in the zero entropy case. We have also storm subjects that uh, have interactions between combinatorics, geometry, etc., and numeration system. Uh, the natural coding of minimal integral exchange transformations also have linear growth complexity. Um, and there are also results of the type that almost every result, almost every a system of a given class, for example, in this case of finite topological rank, um, belongs to one of these classes, in this case of non superlinear growth complexity. So there are a lot of things that happen uh, uh, in either of these classes. 
And it is also important to mention that these classes are the smallest ones that are complexity defined uh, that contain uh, these examples. So uh, if we want to, to try to describe uh, uh, the type of dynamical behavior based on the uh, complexity function, uh, we have to consider uh, uh, these classes um, and are in certain sense, the smallest uh, is the, the smallest complexity defined class that we can use for, for doing so. Uh, even if it is a small complexity, even if these classes uh, have small complexity, um, the, the, the behavior here is, uh, can, can be very complicated. And in general, each of these classes that I, I am presenting here is something that uh, that was not easy to, to, to understand. It, it took many years to understand, for example, substitution of the middle system. Okay, before continuing, I have to present uh, two definitions that are going to be relevant. The first one is transitivity. <clears throat> Um, uh, transitivity is the natural uh, notion of ir irreducibility in uh, in symbolic dynamics. It states that there is a point x such that its orbit stands. Uh, this is the analog of the transitivity notion in group theory, for example. But since we're here we have a topology, we only need that the orbit is dense. It is very easy to encounter transitive system in the low complexity case. At least, uh, it's very common to define transitive systems. Uh, but we're going to use something stronger, which is minimality. Uh, minimality means that every orbit is tensing. It is in general stronger than transitivity, but it's going to be useful because um, it will allow us to uh, simplify the statements and the discussion in general. But uh, it is important to mention that the two structure theorems that I will present hold in the transitive aperiodic. Okay, so we want to study low complexity systems and in particular those two complexity classes that I have defined. Uh, why? Uh, what is the, the, the starting point for doing so? And this is an observation that uh, is something that was made throughout the years, throughout uh, many papers, uh, and it's a conclusion of that the community made uh, uh, based on, on, on the study of several classes of low complexity systems. And the observation is the following. Low complexity systems have shown to be very rigid. So if we have a complexity assumption, then we can bound uh, uh, sorry, if we have a complexity assumption and we have a dynamical property of the system, then we can bound how complex this dynamical property is in terms of the uh, complexity, if the complexity is low enough. Uh, there are many examples of how uh, this is true. For example, uh, it is a more or less recent theorem that says that if we have linear growth complexity, a complexity assumption, then the automorphism group of the associated uh, symbolic system is small in the sense that is, for example, virtually Z. So it is almost as, as small as it can be. Uh, we also have, for example, voucher Nitzan's theorem that bounds the number of ergodic measures in terms of the complexity function. And here, ergodic measure is a dynamical term that is very important to understand, and so on. So uh, this led to the development of an intuition. An intuition uh, that the community made uh, since the 70s, 80s is that there must be a hidden structure that explains the rigidity. Uh, so if we can find this structure, then we can uh, unify in a certain way the observations about how the complexity restricts the dynamical property. Uh, this is a vaguely defined uh, intuition uh, because I haven't said anything about what do we mean with the structure. But there is a, a more concrete version of this, which is what in the 90s was called the SAD conjugate. And it says the following. We consider the class L of linear growth complexity subjects, um, which is defined by this complexity restriction. The conclusion of the conjecture is that there is an aesthetic structure theorem for this class. Now, aesthetic, uh, an aesthetic structure is something that I will define in the next section. The important thing is that it's a particular type of, of, of pro procedure for, uh, for defining a structure in a symbolic system. It is a hierarchical one defined uh, using substitutions and, and other things. Um, uh, and so people think that it's possible to characterize the linear growth complexity and to understand the, uh, the linear growth complexity using this type of structure. Uh, an important point about the conjecture is that uh, it is ill-defined in the sense that uh, it is not saying uh, exactly the type of aesthetic structure that we want to find. It's more or less uh, something about that uh, if we uh, under, uh, try to understand the class from uh, this hierarchical type of structure, then we will find some conditions that allows us to really characterize the, the class uh, from this viewpoint. This is the problem that we want to, 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 to solve. Before uh, continuing with this discussion, I have to define this static terminology. And in general, it is a bit uh, technical to do because uh, there is a lot of notation involved. 
And that's why I will start with an example. And we will uh, do some computations and we will arrive to a figure that describes a structure for, for the points in, in, the, in this subject. And that is going to be formalized using uh, this static terminal. Okay, so we start with the starting example. Uh, this is a subject uh, with complexity m plus one. And we take a point um, x in, 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 the, in the subject. Uh, we are going to do some computations. The first observ observation here is that the complexity at one is equal to two. So we only have two letters occurring in x, zero and one. And the second thing uh, here is that the complexity at two is equal to three. So from the four possible words that can occur in X, there is exactly one of them that does not occur. In this case, if we examine X, we can realize that it is the word zero, zero. Uh, this is important because it implies that each time that we see a zero, we see a one to the, uh, to next to the zero. We can group these occurrences of zeros and one in HD into these red boxes, and then we can codify the original sequence using a new one. The red boxes are replaced by a zero, and the one is kept as a one. We can recover the renal sequence using the substitution rule in the right-hand side of the, of the screen. Uh, and the crucial point here is that the new sequence, the codifying sequence, is again of complexity plus one. Um, so we can iterate the procedure. Uh, we obtain new codification sequence, a sequence of cod codification sequences. And uh, if we stop after a, this, uh, after a fixed number of steps, uh, in this, time, this case, I think it's six, six uh, steps, we arrive to this type of decomposition for X. Um, this hierarchical decomposition, it, is, um, it can be split into different levels, it is something that um, can be formalized using SID sequences, and that's what we are going to do now. Uh, but it's important to, to keep in mind this, this type of figure. We're going to come back to it later. Uh, so the first thing here is the notion of substitution. So a substitution is a map that maps words in a uh, in, over uh, an alphabet to work in a, maybe a different alphabet. And that satisfies this type of uh, restriction. The idea is that uh, the image of a substitution uh, of a word is simply uh, the result of applying the substitution rule to each letter in the word and then concatenating all these results to obtain a, a word. That's why it's called a substitution rule. It substitutes letters into words. And then we define a directive sequence as a, se as a sequence of substitution, bold tau, having this particular form. Uh, the, the idea here is that we have a coherence between the domains and codomains of the substitution, uh, substitutions, so that uh, this type of uh, compositions, uh, tau n until tau n minus one, make uh, sense. Um, this reverse type of, of compositions. We're going to use a lot of this, this type of um, compositions. That's why we are going to abbreviate them using this notion, tau n uh, m. Now, um, uh, something important is that we're going to always assume that these directive sequences satisfies, satisfy the everywhere growing condition. This means that this type of condition holds. And uh, this is mostly because we want to avoid certain pathological behavior. Uh, non everywhere growing uh, uh, directive sequences exist. Uh, sometimes they appear, but it's very rare. So this is a mild hypothesis. Um, uh, the, the, here, the idea is that if we consider uh, what uh, I will call base blocks, which are words of this particular form, so we consider the first n substitutions, we compose them, uh, and then we, um, we, we consider the image of letters and the, this re resulting uh, substitution. These are, 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 are what I will call base blocks, and the everywhere one condition is, is saying that these base blocks uh, for each level uh, have lengths that grow to infinity in an uniform way. Um, okay, so we can now define subjects, symbolic systems associated to a uh, directive sequence. So the first thing is that we find an alphabet, and from the alphabet we uh, define a subject. This is the standard way. Uh, the, fir the first thing is that the language ln, uh, l tau n, sorry, is the set of all subwords of the building blocks that start at level n. Uh, and then we can define the static subject as the infinite points in the nth level, sorry, in the nth alphabet that locally belong to this language. So locally belong here means that any final subword of X belongs to the language. Uh, this is the standard way of defining a subject from uh, an infinite set of words. Um, so we have defined a sequence of subjects, not only just one subject, uh, but we're going to be interested in the zero level. That's why we use that um, abbreviated notation. 
Uh, the zero level is what we really care, care about, but the other levels are going to play an important role because they are going to uh, describe the hierarchical, this hierarchical property about the static structure. And um, there is a property, a fact, uh, that describes in formal terms this uh, hierarchical uh, uh, property of, of static subjects. And it says that for every level n, we can obtain the nth subject using the level n plus one. So in general, we can understand the zero level using the other levels. This is like the probably the, the, the most uh, character, characteristic uh, property of a static subject, this hierarchical uh, way of understanding it, uh, understand them. Um, okay, so we come back to the figure, uh, the Stormian example. We have this decomposition for X and we can formalize it using um, directive sequences in this way. So we take two subdivision rules, sigma zero and sigma one, the ones that appear in this inductive process that we define, and then we put those substitutions in a particular order, in the order in which they appear during the inductive process. We obtain a directive sequence, and with the directive sequence, we can retrieve any fin uh, finite word, subword of X by simply taking a big level, in this case, the level six or seven, taking a letter in that level, and then applying the morphisms according to, to the order given by the directive sequence. And in this way, we, we recover a part of X. And this can be done for any finite subword of, sub of X. Um, another thing is that um, here we can see also uh, the different levels of the static subject, because if we fix uh, one step of the inductive pro pro procedure, then we obtain an infinite word, uh, in this case, Y. And, and this infinite word belongs to, to the corresponding static subject in that level. Uh, the interesting thing is that we can recover X from Y if we apply the subdivision rules in the order given by the static sequence. This is what the fact, uh, the characterization fact uh, about the static subject that presented in the last slide was saying. So in general, when we talk about the static subject, we have to think about this type of uh, decomposition of X. Uh, another thing that I want to mention here is that uh, in part, this type of construction were motivated by other similar constructions more or less similar constructions that come from um, measure, measure theoretical animal systems uh, from dynamics on the counter set in which people consider not this symbolic approach, but something that they call towers. Uh, the, the rolling lemma is something important in measure theoretic dynamical systems. Kagurani uh, rolling partition work uh, for um, uh, dynamics on the counter set, minimal dynamics on the counter set. And when uh, we do the translation to the symbolic setting, we obtain something more or less like this. Uh, it doesn't seem that we have a tower here, but if we rotate the figure 90 degrees to, 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 to the left, then we can see certain towers that are defined by, by this point here, the, the zero coordinate of X. I don't want to enter into those details. I just want to say that there are some motivations that come from those more abstract theories. Okay, so we have a static sequences and I can start uh, I can return to, to the study conjecture, the thing that we want to mention. So we have this observation, the intuition, the concrete version of the intuition that appeared in the 90s. And uh, um, I also want to recall that it's interesting to consider the class L of linear growth complexity subjects because it has connections with many areas. So we want to develop tools to understand. Uh, I want to say something about the password uh, that also explains a little uh, why people started to consider aesthetic structures. And the first one is the uh, well-known uh, paper of Cobin and Hellum from the 73, in which they studied sternal subjects, those of having, that have complexity in plus one. And what they prove is that they correspond, uh, there is a one-to-one -one equivalence uh, co correspondence between this kind of minimal uh, sternal subjects and certain codification of, of, um, of rotations in, in the circle, irrational rotation of the circle. And what they did is, um, is to find first a decomposition of the points that in today's terminology, can be described using aesthetic structures. In that time, uh, the name was, wasn't was coined yet, so uh, they didn't say anything about aesthetic, aestheticity. Uh, but the thing is that they established this deep connection between an irrational number and the uh, continuous fraction and this uh, decomposition use that uses, uh, that uses uh, substitution. Um, an important point here is that they used just two substitutions, the two that we, we define in, in, the, in the figure. And in general, the, the example that I gave uh, is precisely the argument of Kobe and Hill. Uh, another thing is that uh, we have a paper of Arnaud and Rossi from the 92, in, in which uh, they were in part motivated uh, by, 
by the question of whether the, the, the work of Cohen and Hellum could be generalized to other types of complexity. Uh, so they consider certain sequences of complexity to, to n plus one, very similar to the complexity n plus one. And he could give an analog uh, in the sense that he could give uh, a structure um, uh, very similar to, to the one of Cohen and Hellum, also a static with today's, to today's notation. And this time with three substitutions. Um, it's important to note that even if the complexity is very similar to the case of Coven and Hellum, uh, the case of Arnold Rossi is already much more complicated. Uh, and they introduce new techniques that are important uh, until today. It was a very influ influential paper. Um, OK, uh, another thing that I want to mention is the theorem of Cassegna from the 95, uh, in which he proved that a transitive subject of linear growth complexity uh, is such that the first difference of the complexity function is bound. Now, um, the first thing is that, of course, if the first difference of the uh, complexity function is bounded, then the subject has linear growth, linear growth complexity. The converse is non-trivial. The second thing is, why do we care about the first difference of the complexity function? And the thing is that this quantity is related to uh, things like spatial words and Rossi graphs and other important constructions in symbolic dynamics. So making this link uh, was very important, for example, for proving uh, this theorem of Frank C from 90C. Um, so first a definition, uh, we say that a directive sequence is finitary if uh, uh, the number of substitution rules that appear in the directive sequence is fine. And what Frank C proved using the theorem of Cassegne is that any transitive subject of linear growth complexity is generated by a finitary directive sequence. So in some sense, uh, the theorem theorem of Frank C is a generalization of the two first theorems because the, the work of Gobin and Hellu and uh, of Rossiya and Arnoux um, are uh, based on finitary direct sequences. They have two and three substitutions. So in some sense, is this a um, generalization? Uh, it has a, a problem that, uh, that is related to the fact that even, um, uh, even given the fact that Frank C gave an algorithm for computing this finite, finite set of substitution rules that can appear, it is not easy to decide in which order, order we have to put this substitution so that we uh, obtain a directive sequence that generates a subject with linear growth context. And that problem is open until today. So we don't know, uh, uh, even, even if we have this substitution, we don't know how to characterize and to understand the linear growth complexity class from, uh, this, uh, uh, from this theory. Another thing, and the last thing about the theorem is that Frank C used in a crucial way the theorem of Cassegne uh, because his construction is based on right special words and uh, Rossi graphs. Uh, so he needed this connection between the linear growth complexity and the first difference of the complexity function. Um, okay. And the last thing that I want to mention, and uh, there are another thing uh, other than this, but uh, another paper that I want to mention here is the work of uh, Julien Leroy from 2013, work that he did during his PhD thesis, and uh, in which he proved and he described a finitary static structure for the case in which the complexity satisfies this bound. And um, so again, uh, this uh, is in some sense a small, uh, a small uh, complexity. But it's already uh, a very complicated case. And in fact, the, uh, the techniques that uh, Julian developed in this paper uh, have been useful in other works. Unfortunately, the technique cannot be generalized to consider the full conjecture. So uh, it is not possible to describe any, uh, any linear growth complexity uh, in a finitary way using at least these techniques. Uh, there are other works that uh, instead of trying to directly solve the conjecture and finding a good static uh, structure, they try to narrow down a bit the type of search static structure. Because as I was saying, uh, it is, uh, the conjecture is not saying exactly which type of static structure uh, we're looking for. And um, so they started to investigate other types of, of properties. Uh, some, um, there are um, several intuitions uh, around um, these ideas, uh, but the problem is that none of those proposed conditions or, or restrictive forms of the static uh, conjecture is considered satisfactory because of several reasons. I don't want to, want to I don't want to to, to say more about uh, th these things because it's uh, it's a different direction and there's a, a lot of work here. Um, okay, so this is the last thing that I wanted to mention. In general, uh, what I want to remark remark is that uh, uh, these uh, works 
Some of them appear before the statement of the SAD conjecture because some of them were motivation of the SAD conjecture. And that in general, uh, the ideas that were developed during um, these works uh, ha ha have been influential in other types of papers and results. Okay, um, so the, the first main result, um, I want to state the first main result and um, I need uh, a definition, a last definition. If W is a word, then I will say, uh, I will denote by root of W, uh, the shortest prefix V of W such that W is a power of V. So for example, the root of the word AB, AB, AB is equal to AB, but if we take now the, the this sim very similar looking word, then we'll obtain a completely different result. The idea is that having a small root implies having a small period that is uh, in, in certain sense synchronized with the length of the of the of the initial word. Uh, the converse is in general false. If we start with a word of small period, then the root can be big. Um, this is an example of that. So th there is a, a subtle bit there. Okay, and the main theorem says that in the middle in the middle case, if we have a subject of linear growth complex, sorry, if we have a subject then it has linear growth complexity if and only if we can an aesthetic structure of the following form. There exists a constant d, a uniform constant d, and a directive sequence tau that generates x, of course, uh, such that for every level n, we have three pro properties. Uh, so we have a, here a concrete uh, aesthetic structure. Uh, that's the idea. Um, I'm going to start with the third condition because it is uh, the simplest one. It simply says that if we consider um, each of these substitution rules in, in the directive sequence, then we obtain something that is bounded in the sense that the uh, words that are, at, that are substitution of letters have a uniformly bounded length. Um, the second condition, C2, is something that in other uh, contexts, uh, people that work, for example, with tower partitions uh, and uh, and those things that I was commenting before, call the proportional tower condition, because when we interpret directly sequences um, their structure using towers, then we have towers that have more or less the, the same length. Here it is almost the same. Um, the condition says that the base blocks have the same length up to a multiplicative constant that is uniformly bound, in this case d. So in general here the idea is that this is a uniform constant that bounds three different um, uh, things in the directive sequence. Uh, and the first one is um, a condition that says that if we, if we now consider the set of roots of the base blocks of a fixed level, then we'll obtain something, again, of uniformly bound cardinality. Um, okay, so condition C2 is something that was considered before. It appears, for example, in substitution dynamical systems. Uh, C3 also, substitution also satisfies this, you know, little going subject, a lot of things satisfy uh, condition C3, and C1 is the new ingredient that appear in this work. And in general, C1 and C3 were conceived as a weakening of the finitary condition because uh, this three condition does not necessarily imply that the alphabets A n have a uniformly bounded cardinality, and so we can have infinitely many uh, substitution rules appearing in the directive sequence. Now, in general, the theorem is a bit technical to read. Uh, in general, the sub terminology is a bit technical to read. That's why I will present a corollary with a figure uh, to try to explain in a better way the three conditions and what this is, theorem is saying at an intuitive level. So we start with a direct sequence that defines three conditions, C1, C2, and, and C3. And the corollary here says that uh, there exists a uniform constant D, made different from the one that appeared in the previous slide, as for which every point in the subject, uh, and for every point, uh, for, sorry, for every length L, we can find at most V words, WA, that decompose X in a very particular way. X is a concatenation of blocks. Each of these blocks is a power of some WA, and each block has a very controlled length. The length is at least L, but it's not much larger than L. So V here controls two things, uh, the number of words WA that we can use and uh, the, the, the length of, of, the, of the block. Uh, how much control we have on the length of each block. In a figure, it looks like this, and this is, I think, the, 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 um, the most important part of the presentation because it is saying in a very intuitive level uh, what this theorem is saying about the, the, the linear growth complexity class. It is saying that if we consider a linear growth complexity subject, a point in it, and any length L, then we can decompose the point in a very particular way. We have first 
a link position into blocks defined here in the figure by the straight lines. Uh, each of these blocks have more or less the same length. It is controlled by D. And each of the blocks is built using a very controlled set of words WA by simply taking a power of those two words. Uh, we, don't have a, uh, we don't have control on the power that appear here, the number of blocks that we have to use. Uh, for example, this W to the seven could be huge and it happens in, in, in some cases. So that's uh, where the subtlety lies. Uh, and that's the source of the non finitariness of the, of the structures here. Okay, uh, we have a second main result, which is a variation of the first one. Uh, it was a bit unexpected to obtain actually this, this variation, but uh, it is nice to have it. It works for the class of non superlinear growth complexity subject defined by this complexity restriction, the one that appeared in the, for example, in the paper of Antovsky and Bigot about irrationality of, of, of certain numbers. And the, uh, the characterization here is the same. A minimal subject is of non superlinear growth complexity if and only if we have an aesthetic structure of the same type. The only difference is that the condition C3 is not here. And this is related to the fact that uh, here we have a lim inf. So we have control over an infinite subset uh, of, in of, the, of the natural numbers, not for all natural numbers. So C3 is not here. Uh, there is a direct tra translation between these two things. Uh, okay, uh, finally, uh, I want, um, uh, there, there's some discussion that is very necessary to do uh, around those um, two theorems. Mostly because the study conjecture is ill posed. Uh, it is not a clear statement. So we have to, to discuss uh, whether there are some improvements on these theorems. Uh, this is the, the right thing that this is what we wanted to, to obtain or not, etc. Uh, so the, the first observation here is about finitariness. Uh, all the past work that I cited uh, consider finitary uh, static structures. And that's uh, uh, the, the norm, actually. Most of them consider finitary structures. Our theorem is not finitary, and in fact, it's intrinsically not finitary in the sense that it cannot be improved. It cannot be improved to something finitary. More precisely, we can prove this theorem that says that there is a minimal subject of linear growth complexity such that any static structure, any direct sequence satisfying the three properties in the main theorem is not finitary. And so this may seem as something bad, but we, what we think based on the example that we have to, to build for proving this theorem is that this non finitariness is something intrinsic to the class and not to our theorem. And that's why we state this conjecture that says that there is no finitary static structure theorem for the linear growth complexity class. Uh, this is not a formal statement in the same sense that the static conjecture is not something very concrete. But we think that this is a concrete, uh, a, a concrete research direction that is worth looking, uh, worth considering. Uh, and now the other thing is about applications. We have an SLA structure and the initial idea was to try to explain the rigidity observed in the low complexity class, in these low complexity classes, by using the, the aesthetic structure. So another question here is, when is a particular aesthetic structure useful? Is our aesthetic structure useful? And the tautological answer here is, if we can use those theorem, this theorem that I have presented, uh, for proving interesting theorems and useful theorems, then it is worth considering uh, and using for other things, these theorems. And based on this idea, we try to recover some known things about the linear growth complexity class and uh, of non superlinear linear growth complexity class. And the first thing that we recovered was uh, the theorem of, of uh, Julian Cassegne, uh, the one that connects linear growth complexity with the boundedness of the first difference of the complexity function. And we could do this by using our structure theorem, our description, and certain known aesthetic techniques. There, there is a lot of papers that deal with aesthetic subjects, with bretel versic diagrams, which are very similar. The techniques can be transferred from one place to another uh, that uses Kakoni uh, rolling partitions and so on. So there is a lot of literature in, that we can use to, to, to take the techniques from and apply it to our case. And this is the case for recovering Cassin's theorem. Um, we can also recover other kind of things. For example, uh, it was recently proved by, by Kretz in this year that minimal subjects of non-superlinear um, non growth complexity are partially rigid. And this means uh, something related to invariant measure. Uh, it is an interesting pro property to have. It is a strengthening of something that Frank C. proved in 96 about uh, linear growth complexity subjects. And the thing is that we can reprove this. We can give a new proof based on this structure and some known tools. There, is some, there are some papers in which uh, people study 
um, uh, strongly mixing, which is related to, 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 to this notion of partial rigidity. Uh, so we can recover uh, this result. There is also a result of Duran, uh, Donoso, Mass and Petit from 2021, in which they proved that non superlinear uh, non growth complexity subjects that are minimal have finite W rank. And here, finite W rank is a rigidity condition, it's similar to the complexity in the sense that it tries to uh, control how complex a system can be. Uh, and we also can recover this using known techniques. Um, it's important to remark here that this finite oblique rank condition implies that we have finitely many ergodic measures. So uh, recovering this property uh, can be seen as an analog of Bocher Nitzan theorem, uh, because uh, we have in particular from our theorem, we can deduce from our theorem uh, that uh, any subject, minimal subject or linear growth complexity has finitely many ergodic measures. And the last thing is uh, that we also recovered a characterization or a combinatorial characterization of the linear growth complexity class for in the transitive case. Um, uh, that was obtained by Kassain, Free, Free, Anna Fried, Prusinina, and Samboni in 2019. Um, as a conclusion, and with this, I am, uh, I am finalizing the, the talk. Um, more precisely, our conclusion uh, after all this result is that these two classes of non superlinear growth complexity and linear growth complexity gain an effective access to the static toolset. Uh, and thus, the theorems that I have presented provide a unified framework for at least these results. So we're looking uh, for other things that we can uh, try to, to, to understand, maybe new things, uh, but this is in general work in progress. Um, so thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Bastian, uh, for that uh, excellent talk. Uh, does anyone have uh, any questions for Bastian? Thanks. Um, Uh, yes, so uh, hi, Bastian. Uh, thank you for your uh, great talk. So I've got a question, uh, which is, um, uh, can you tell more about your example of the non-finitary uh, case? Um, you, um, yeah, um, uh, I don't know much much more to, to say. Um, it's something a bit technical. Um, uh, let me think. Um, Uh, ah, okay. Yeah, the thing is that uh, about uh, this theorem, uh, the, um, this no finitariness, uh, is that, um, for example, in Sturmian subjects and in general in dendritic subjects, uh, we have a property that says that if we have a word, then uh, there are not many powers of a word that can appear. Uh, and I think that in the Sturmian case, is that, that they can appear at least three different, essentially different powers. Uh, there are some technicalities. Uh, this is related to something. Uh, very particular in the construction uh, that was used in the proof, and um, it breaks certain things. Um, so if we construct an example in which many, many different powers at different length scales occur, um, then uh, this situation is not very well adapted to, to the fact that we have uh, actually condition C2, um, the one of proportional uh, towers. Um, there, there is some desynchronization, thank you. Sorry, it's not easy to say, a bit technical. Uh, but the thing is that if we have many different powers, uh, then there is something that uh, is broken and does not work very well with the condition C2. Thank you. Um, oh, uh, Benjamin, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. Hope you can hear me. Uh, even if you don't have a finitary result, uh, you said something at the end, and I'm not sure I understood well. Uh, do you still have a computability of uh, of the, the the sequence of the directive sequence? Uh, yes, uh, it's it's a corollary, although it is not stated in the paper that the construction is uh, computable. If we start with a big set, uh, we start with something computable, of course, in the correct sense. Okay. Because at first we, we may start with a subject that is not computable. But it's very concrete. We just have to find the right special words and do some movements, and we obtain the structure. Thanks. Uh, if I may add another question, do, do you have any intuition of uh, what kind of class we would get if you took your conditions and you added the finitary condition? 
Uh, do you have any hope that it could, you know, characterize subshift with this additional like, linear subshift with this property or something? Uh, I am not very sure. I haven't done the computations, but I think that in the linear growth complexity case, at least, um, adding the finitary condition um, would characterize the class of linear growth complexity subjects, in which something that they call the power complexity is bound. And this power complexity is uh, the maximum number of different powers that a uh, word of a given length uh, can have inside the subject. So it's related to Valerie's question. Um, in, in the papers, it's a bit uh, better explained. Uh, if you want to know more, uh, I can send you an email. Okay, sure. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Julien. Yes. Uh, thank you, Bastian, for, for your talk. Um, I, I have a question. I think I already asked it to you uh, maybe several times, but maybe you made some progress. Uh, so if you take a Sturmian subshift with uh, unbounded uh, partial quotients, uh, I guess that your construction gives you a, a non-finitary uh, sequence of morphisms. Uh, but can you interpret your, your sequence in terms of, I don't know, in classical properties of Termian or, or on uh, uh, continuous function and so on? Um, okay, three things. The first one is that I haven't worked on that yet. <laughs> I want to do it because several <laughs> people have asked me about that. Uh, the second thing is that, uh, at least in the Termian case, and in general in the Dendrit case, this construction gives uh, something that is finitary because we have a very controlled, uh, we have a lot of control on the different number of powers for a given word that can occur inside the subject. Uh, the same thing that I was telling to Valeria and Benjamin. Uh, and the third thing is that although I know that it is finitary, uh, I have the impression, and I'm not really sure, that uh, the resulting structure is going to be very different to the one obtained from the, the classic one, the, the base on, on written words and etc. Uh, but I, I can't say anything more. I have to do the computation. Okay, so you're able to control both the the length of the the images and to the the ratio between the lengths, even in the uh, the unbound with unbounded partial quotients. Yes. Okay, but but probably it's going to be something different to the classic structure for a star. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Uh, Valérie? Yeah, yes, I continue with the question of Julien. So in this case, if you find another SIDIC system for the Stumian case, do you expect to keep the properties of uh, more automorphism that the substitutions are positive um, automorphisms of the group, free group? Do you expect to keep some algebraic property of invertibility of the substitutions of the system, or you think you you will jump to another kind of substitutions? Yeah, the second thing. I think we will jump to okay. something very different and with worse properties in general. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I see it as a trade-off between generality and and how specific we can be in this term case. Any other questions? Oh, if not, uh, thank you again, Bastien. Thanks. Uh, before we go then, um, I think uh, most of you know that uh, we alternate weeks now with the uh, numeration seminar. So uh, next week, uh, next Tuesday will be a uh, numeration talk. And then uh, two weeks from now, um, we'll have uh, James Curry speaking in the uh, Common Shorts on Word seminar. So um, yeah, bye for now. And uh, I'll see you all uh, in two weeks. Thanks, see you in two weeks. Thanks everyone, bye-bye. <laughs>